Hello, my name is Adam Elliott and I'm an animation writer and director. And I live here in Melbourne and today I'm going to talk to you about how I make my films. But more importantly, why I make my films. My style of animation uh, has various terms. Uh, most commonly it's called stop motion animation. Uh, another term is claymation. Uh, I've actually invented my own term and that is uh, what I make are what's called clayographies which is clay animated biographies and I'm thinking of getting that word uh, trademarked uh, but it really is, is very apt because it, it is uh, what I do is an amalgamation of different things. Uh, I tell biographies that are animated that just happen to be uh, in plasticine uh, and uh, everything in my films Every prop, every set, every character is a real tangible object. The skies are real painted canvases, rain, uh, we use a fishing line, fire is red cellophane. So, so we can confidently say to the audience when they see an Adam Elliott film that what they're seeing is 100% made in camera in a traditional manner and that every prop, set and character that they see uh, has been handcrafted. Well, there's a few reasons I choose uh, stop motion animation over CGI. And uh, the main reason is because I like using my hands. Um, we do use computers for editing and sound and other bits and pieces, and they do assist what we do, but the bulk of what we do is with our hands. And very early on in my career, I realized that I could never be a computer animator because sitting in front of a computer screen all day for me would be very frustrating. I have to, you know, I have to get paint on my fingers. I, I, I love using glue and wood and metal and rubber. And, and for me, it's, it's a, to me, it's a very um, almost primeval uh, way of, of making art. And the other great thing about stop motion is that uh, on my films, I've been able to employ people who share my passion and who are like-minded. And we are a rare breed. Uh, and it's great working with other people who also like getting their hands dirty. You, you can do 2D animation, 3D animation, you can animate sand, you know, there's all sorts of ways to animate. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, it's the story that's the most important thing. With all my films, uh, I've always said that I've never been obsessed by their length. Uh, because my films are biographies, I always let the characters tell me how long their stories should be. My first uh, four films were all shorts. Uh, the first was uncle, then cousin, then brother. And they were all roughly about five minutes in length. They each took about a year to make. And after I'd made those three, I thought, well, I feel like I want to explore a biography that's a bit longer, a bit more challenging. So that's when we decided to pursue Harvey Crumpet. And Harvey ended up telling us that his story should be about 23 minutes, which was a perfect commercial half hour for SBS television. You know, I'd always focused on one character and I thought, well, it's time I, I really sort of explored multiple characters. And that's when we decided to make Mary Max. And, uh, and Mary Max is still, it's still biographical, but it's really about two lead characters. And when I sat down to write that, I wasn't sure if it was gonna be feature length. I knew it was definitely more than a, than a half hour. But luckily, once I started writing, and I'd never written a feature, but once I'd started writing, uh, I realised that this was almost of epic proportions. Uh, and if anything, we had uh, too much to tell. So we paired it back to about 90 minutes, which is, uh, which again, is a perfect length for animation. For some reason, animation that's over 100 minutes becomes a bit, uh, becomes a bit uh, intolerable. I think you, once you've suspended your disbelief, for that amount of time in animation, it doesn't work. So most animated features are generally under 100 minutes. Once the storyboard and the script are what we call locked off, uh, we then move into a very intense pre-production stage. And on Mary and Max, that took about six to eight months. And that's where we really planned uh, the aesthetic to the film, um, how detailed we could go with the sets and props and really worked out all the logistics. And that's also the period where we uh, set up the studio, decided upon which cameras we were going to use, started to employ all the artists, uh, all the camera department, of course the animators, uh, and getting our crew together. And so it's a very intense uh, um, 
scary period because um, you really, that's your chance to get everything prescribed. Because once you start shooting, uh, you have to be absolutely ready. In Australia, we have wonderful crews who, who are very uh, multi-skilled. And so in our pre-production period, uh, people who were the head sculptors were also building props and sets. And, and uh, it was a very, uh, I, I, say, I often say I wasn't the director of the film, I was the ringmaster of the circus. And those first six months were very, um, uh, well, controlled chaos and, and slightly uh, out of control. But we got there in the end. Once we started shooting Mary and Max, um, things really um, started to become streamlined and my day became very predictable. Uh, I was always first to arrive at around 7am and generally last to leave at about 8 in the evening. I ended up working seven days a week, uh, extremely long hours. Uh, but really I had to because I was the director of the film and I suppose the, the conductor of the orchestra the ringmaster of the circus. So the buck ended with me. Nick Park, the director of uh, all the Aardman features, Chicken Run, Wallace and Gromit and, and uh, those sorts of features, he said many years ago in a documentary that being a director on a stop motion animated film is like being creative with a gun at your head. Uh, everything is pressurised and you have to make snap decisions and uh, sometimes you make the wrong decisions. Uh, but generally you, you've just got to go with your gut instinct. Uh, luckily Mary Max was all in my head, I'd memorised the whole script virtually and uh, these characters were very real people to me so in a way they directed themselves. With animated films usually you get the actors in right up front, you record their voices and then you work out how long each shot's going to be and you mould the characters around the voice. But because my films are, are driven by narration, it meant that we had the luxury of getting some of the actors in later. And it really depended on what the actor was, was, what character the actor was playing. So for Barry Humphreys, who was our narrator, he wasn't a character, he was just this anonymous voice. So we really could have got Barry in at any, any time. So we decided to get him, him in early and, uh, and that was good. But we also got him in the middle and we also got him in at the end. With the other actors, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, we would have loved to have got him in in the early stages, but of course he's a very uh, in-demand actor and of course living in another country. And it took us a year just to, to get him to agree to say yes, he would do the film. Uh, he'd never done an animated film before. Uh, he'd never heard of me. Uh, but once we got him the script, which took a year just to get him the script, once he read the script, he said yes. Uh, and then to record him, we couldn't afford to fly him out from America. So we actually recorded him remotely uh, in New York. So we had a sound studio there, a sound studio here, and via a very expensive uh, cable hookup, we recorded him remotely. It's very, very difficult to record your actor when they're in another country. The irony is I've never met Philip Seymour Hoffman, but we, we spent two very long days together and we feel like we've met each other. We, we both find it a bit odd that we still haven't met. Um, but uh, so we got Philip in at the end, which wasn't ideal, but um, we just had to, to, to live with that. Uh, and the other actors, Eric Banner, Tony Collette, we sort of got them in sort of midway to, and, and towards the end as well. So in a way, what we did was unconventional. Um, a lot of animators wouldn't, wouldn't like to work that way, but uh, for us, um, the fact that we had these big names meant that we had to be a little bit more flexible and get them in when we could. Uh, in Mary Max, we had uh, over 200 characters and every one of those characters I chose to design myself. Uh, for the lead characters they got a much more polished uh, character drawing uh, but for the lesser characters like the Blowfly and, and Albert in the background uh, a lot of the time it would be just a quick pencil sketch that I would then give to the sculptors to work from. And someone said if I'd have made the entire film myself it would have taken 235 years. So the reality was I had to get sculptors to learn how to sculpt in my style. And that was really difficult, that was a real challenge. I'd never articulated before what my style was. So we came up with a style bible. 
and that was this very thick document that, that articulated uh, what my style was and we soon discovered that my style was chunky wonky. Everything in the film had a chunky wonky look to it. There were no straight lines. Every prop had to look like it had been dropped once. Uh, every prop had to be look, look like it had been bought at an op shop. Uh, and then everything had to be grunged up and aged. My aesthetic's very uh, organic. Uh, we had about uh, four or five sculptors, uh, two, uh, two uh, lead sculptors were uh, Darren Bell and a guy called Caleb Nutt and then another guy Darcy uh, came in halfway through and uh, they, um, they would just sit there in this room sculpting all day. Once it was sculpted it went, then went off to the mould baking room and a mould would be made of it and depending on what the puppet had to do uh, sometimes it would be a very basic mould but other times the puppet would need a very uh, complex armature and an armature is a uh, steel skeleton which sits inside the puppet which keeps it rigid and means that the puppet can be manipulated to, into any shape without its arm or legs dropping. It would almost be in a frozen movement. In animation there's 24 frames per second so if a character waves their hand and you see that on screen for a second it means we have to move the character's hand 24 times. So basically you move the character's hand take a photograph, move it again, take another photograph, do that 24 times and you have one second of animation, which is why animation is so slow and so expensive. Each one of our animators did about five seconds on average per day. So over a week we would only shoot two and a half minutes, which is why the shoot went for so long. Now with Einstein in the background, he was um, for a photograph that appeared in the film of Albert Einstein. And we could have just got a photograph of Albert Einstein and put it in a frame, but we thought, no, no, every character has to look like it was, you know, it exists in this world. So our sculptor, I think he spent about a week just sculpting that little Albert Einstein for one three second shot in the film. So some, some puppets got a lot more attention than, than they deserved, but we always had to work out, well, if that character's only on screen for, for a couple of seconds, we can only afford to spend a week on that puppet. All my films are, are about characters who are considered outsiders or, or marginalised or underdogs. And the reason I write about these characters is, is it goes back to my childhood. And in the playground, I would uh, tend to befriend all the kids who were teased or bullied or seen as strange or weird and I don't know why, but I had a terrible, a huge amount of um, empathy for these people. And that's a word I use a lot. Um, I couldn't understand why these kids were being teased and, and misunderstood. And so all these years later, that's manifested in my writing. My writing is about trying to educate, without being preachy or getting on my soapbox, but trying to educate the audience and get them to understand what it's like to have Asperger's syndrome, what it's like to have Tourette's, what it's like to have Alzheimer's, and really um, put themselves in my character's shoes. In a way, people say comedy is the hardest thing to do, and in a way for me, comedy is the easiest thing to do. The hardest thing to do is to get an audience to totally fall in love with your character and be moved and be fighting for them, be on their size, side and really empathise with them and I find that incredibly challenging. I always say that, I always pretend that when an audience are watching my film they're each sitting in a little compost heap and by the end of the film they leave the cinema feeling nourished, that they've absorbed everything they've seen and that they leave the cinema uh, feeling like I haven't wasted their time, that they now everything's a little bit clearer but I, I really respect and acknowledge the power of cinema and the power to really have an effect on people. Um, there's no better moment for me than uh, seeing an audience come out of the cinema uh, with red eyes and tissues and, and knowing that I've made them cry. And for me, that's the most happy experience I can have is to know that I've made 300 people cry. That sounds a bit sadistic, but uh, you know, that, that's my aim as, as a writer, essentially, and as a director. Um, so yeah, filmmaking is a very powerful experience and you really have to respect the, uh, the control that you can have over an audience.